All right, so let's continue with the behavioral patterns. And this is the last of the big groups from the Gang of Four book. As you can already imagine, these are used to uh, control objects and interact with them, of course. Um, bit of background reading is available here again. Uh, but we will also going to look into four important examples. These are iterator, the command pattern, visitor, and last but not least, observer. All right, so uh, let's again start with the, the probably most prominent behavioral pattern. This is iterator. And the fundamental idea here is that you have a collection of objects and want to step through all of these objects. And uh, a very, very widely used implementation of this is actually um, containers in Java and in C++ as well. Um, the fundamental idea behind the iterator is that you can split the uh, data structures that store your data from the algorithms that operate on your data. And so your uh, any data structure like this container here will uh, return an iterator object for a specific type of item, whatever is stored in that uh, container. Um, so you have a get iterator method and the iterator itself, and this is actually the core part of the pattern, has these four uh, methods. It has a method to set the iterator to the very first item in the collection. It has a method to step to the next item in the collection, which is kind of obvious from the name. It has a method to retrieve the current item. And it has a method to check whether there are any future items left. Sometimes you will see implementations where uh, two of these methods um, have been combined. So for example, if current returns null, then that means you're at the end of the list and you don't need a separate has next method, or uh, you don't have a first method and uh, the iterator is always at the first element when it's, uh, it's first delivered to you. So there are slight variations, but uh, a full-featured iterator would contain uh, exactly these four methods. They don't maybe have the exactly same names, but the, fu uh, the functionality is uh, exactly the same. So you can start at the first item in the list, you can step to the next item, you can retrieve the current item and do something with it, and you can get the, uh, you can check whether there is a next item left. So and with these four um, functions, it doesn't actually matter to you how the data is actually stored. If it's just a plain old array, or if it's something like a balanced tree, or maybe even a, a big database uh, or whatever, this all of this doesn't matter to you. You just take your iterator object and uh, repeatedly call next and retrieve the item with current. Uh, and continue until has next uh, or whatever variation you have until that returns false. So this is um, the entire entire fundamental idea of the iterator pattern. And um, if the items are now, for example, returned in exactly the sequence in which they have originally been stored in the container, or if the container maybe does some additional uh, processing like return the largest element that's still left first always. This is, for example, important for some types of graph algorithms that you want to basically sort the objects in the container by size and do that on the fly. That uh, would be one, uh, one possible example where you can always use the same interface of the iterator to access your data and how the data is stored and processed before it's actually handed to you doesn't really need to concern the, the front end, the user of the iterator in any way. All right, so this is one of the most prominent behavioral patterns. Another one that's also quite common is the command pattern. And here the idea is that a method call is now kind of converted to an object. That means that you can uh, take uh, such a command object, pass them around, put them in a list, and then at a later point in time, whenever it's kind of convenient maybe or, or suitable, 
then you can call this execute function and then the actual method on the target object will be uh, will be executed so you can first for example create a list of actions to to be executed and then um, work through that list of actions later on uh, without having to to uh, care which action each individual individual object contains for example all right let's look at a code example maybe here so let's say we have a uh, class target which has two different types of functions which both take a parameter and then our command object will uh, contain this integer consumer and also a parameter uh, when it's constructed and later on when we actually execute the command then the method is called with the specific parameter which we stored before um, and how do I, how do we use that so let's say we have a target object here and then we create the command object that now tells us we want to execute function 2 with a parameter of 123 and then a lot of time can pass and this command is maybe stored somewhere in the list or whatever and only when we execute then the actual function 2 with parameter 123 will be called and will be will be run and so the the invocation of the command in that way is uh, delegated to a later time and is encapsulated in the um, in the command object so i can easily imagine that i have a, a long list with command objects that i can then execute as a batch uh, even if they have been created individually uh, and step by step before all right so much for the uh, command pattern um, up next is the so-called visitor pattern which is also very common behavioral pattern this is a complement to the uh, structural pattern composite which we talked about earlier and the idea behind the visitor um, is that i have an operation that i will apply to all objects of this tree so this is a recursive operation usually so at every level of the tree i apply a specific operation to each object and then also to all sub objects um, and what's also characteristic for the visitor is that i can add specific functionality to each tree object uh, without really having to change the elements at all on on their own so let's have a look at an example because i think this is again better to visualize uh, at an example let's say our um, our composite pattern is here representing an HTML um, document where we have the, the uh, superclass HTML element and this also already has this so-called accept method which uh, yeah, accepts the visitor basically and then for each type of uh, sub object we have different accept methods for example for the div element which can also contain sub elements so this is actually an implementation of the composite pattern we first uh, call this wizard method on the local object and then we send the visitor on to visit all the children of this uh, element and for uh, for an element which would not have any sub uh, um, sub elements like span then we just call wizard on the local element and what are done with it and uh, orthogonal to this hierarchy we now have the visitor hierarchy so first of all we have the visitor class itself which ha which has these individual visit um, methods for all of the elements in the hierarchy so for one for the diff element one for the span element and so on um, and these this is basically an interface so these methods aren't really implemented yet um, but now i can derive different types of classes from visitor and create different types of functionality within these classes so for example i could have a render visitor which takes the html tree and actually renders it on the screen or i could have a plain text visitor which uh, creates a plain text representation by stripping out all the formatting and just uh, leaving the text and depending on 
what each individual visitor does. I only need to implement that in the actual subclass without having to change the the elements themselves every time. So I would I don't need to add functionality for a render visitor to each element or for a plain text visitor. And later on, for example, if I want a um, a printing visitor which creates a printable representation of the HTML, then I wouldn't would otherwise have to touch every element on its own again. It, solving it this way with the visitor pattern, I only have to create a new subclass of the visitor and can put the functionality all together into that one single class and just do what's suitable for each element within that. So that's the, the fundamental fundamental idea of the, the visitor pattern. Um, there's one addition I might uh, like to mention here that sometimes um, the visitor just doesn't just have within the elements an accept method, but sometimes this accept method is split up into an enter and an exit method. This is especially helpful if you want to keep track, for example, of where you are in the hierarchy, uh, how deep at which level uh, in your tree you already are. And so before you uh, enter an object, then the enter method is called. And when you leave the object, the exit method is called in both uh, both cases with the visitor um, with the visitor object again. All right. Last but not least, one other behavioral object that I'd like to mention is the observer. And uh, so the fundamental idea behind observer is that um, you have some kind of central state and whenever that changes, you will send a notification to objects that depend on that state. And uh, if you think back to the architectural patterns, then model view controller is actually very similar to that description. So we have a central state. In our case, this is the model. And we have uh, multiple views, for example, that are registered at the model and are notified when something changes. So let's say um, the model has a list of views and um, the view can register at the, at the model. Several views can do that at the same time. And whenever the model is actually has been modified, then all of the views that are currently registered uh, are sent an update message. And then depending on what type of view we have, if it's a graphical chart or maybe a table uh, that can actually exist at the same time for the same data. Then whenever the update method is called, we um, we just update the graphical representation and that only has to happen when the data in the model actually changes. All right, so much for the behavioral patterns that occur in the Gang of Four book. That's one more additional behavioral pattern that's not from the book and that's not actually object oriented per se, but which I'd like to mention nevertheless. I'm calling this the main loop pattern. So very uh, many libraries that are for graphics, 3D graphics, uh, user interfaces, widgets and so on, even computer vision, all of these uh, often have a so-called main loop. And so this is basically in your main method, the last thing you do is you start the main loop of the um, library. And then what this main loop does internally roughly looks like this. It will wait until some kind of event has happened. Then that event is retrieved into a variable. Um, and as long as nobody has requested the program to quit, the event will be processed. Um, the problem now is when you have more than one library of this type and want to use them together in one program, then you would have two main loops and you could put them into two threads, but that's usually not such a good idea. Then you get all sorts of race conditions and so on. Um, the solution that people usually come up with is that it is also possible to, 
call these get next event and process methods separately for each um, for each library that you're using and then you simply have to write your own main loop function which does the uh, event retrieval and processing for both libraries at the same time. This is not quite as common, but and again, it's not an object-oriented pattern, but it's still something I'd like to, to mention in case you, you encounter this uh, at some point in the future.